Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. Main Street, Wyoming is made possible in part by grants from Kennecott Energy. Proud to be a part of Wyoming's future in the uranium exploration, mining, and production industry. And by the Wyoming Council for the Humanities, enriching lives of Wyoming people through the study of Wyoming history, values, and ideas. Uh, Gollings, uh, uh, the story goes that he told that he uh, ordered his first set of paints from uh, Montgomery Ward, and uh, this was kind of a mail order um, cowboy artist. A work for the rest of my life is ahead of me with only one thing that would ever take me from it, to be younger and have the country open and unsettled as it was when I first made riding my profession. the National Wildlife Art Museum in Jackson, where the work of Bill Gollings is on tour. Bill Gollings, a cowboy and an artist, lived in Sheridan, Wyoming at the turn of the century. In his art, he captured the last days of the open range. I'm Deborah Hammonds, and today on Main Street, Wyoming, we're going to introduce you to a man that some call Wyoming's Charlie Russell. When Bill Gollings died in 1932, his friend and fellow artist Hans Kleiber wrote, Bill, I think, will be considered the last of the three big artists that were drawn to the pioneering West, and whose work was inspired and sprang convincingly from its soil and life. The first of the three was Remington, and after him came Charles Russell, and the last was our Bill Gollings. We asked Peter Hasrick, director of the Buffalo Bill Historical Center, about the comparison between Wyoming's Bill Gollings and the well-known Montana artist Charles Russell. And they both kind of learned uh, about being creative people from their, from their environment. They were inspired by the world around them as opposed to being inspired so much by an academic training situation. Basically, they learned from their, their peers. Basically, they learned to uh, critique themselves and to respect the uh, criticism of the average people around them who lived that world that they were in. Bill Ward, a Wyoming physician and art collector who has specialized in the life and work of Bill Gollings, shared additional insight about the development of Gollings' reputation. He was very self-demeaning, very temperamental, a gentleman. He didn't realize the value of his art. He had no one to market his art except the furniture store in Sheridan and a few exhibits. I think Bill Gollings was uh, Wyoming's underrated, unknown, and undervalued artist, and people are finally uh, uh, beginning to see his work and this exhibit. Bill was born in the territory of Idaho in 1878, the fourth son of Tilla and Alec Gollings. Bill's mother died when he was two, and he and his brothers were sent back to Michigan to be raised by his grandmother. In 1886, Bill's father remarried, and the boys returned to his homestead outside of Lewiston, Idaho. It was this first winter on the ranch that I took an interest in drawing. My brother Oliver, the next to the oldest, could do about anything, it seemed to me. And among his many accomplishments was his ability to draw a horse in outline on a slate. Then he'd put on a saddle and a bridle. Those simple drawings stick in my memory as clear as any memory I have, and certainly created in me a desire to draw. But I had no idea how to do it. Gollings wrote in his autobiography about the appeal of those days of his childhood. 
There was everything there that we wanted. Horses and cattle, Indians and cowboys, a river to swim in and fish in, good hunting and no game laws. We had seen just the things uh, that thrill a boy. Uh, there were old prospectors who had been 49ers and who carried a cap and ball six shooter wherever they went. There were men left from the trapper period. The town was literally full of Indians of the Nez Perce tribe, bedecked in the most gorgeous colored blankets, faces painted, beautiful beaded buckskin garments and lots of their old time finery. They were mostly bareheaded, but occasionally a war bonnet was seen or a buffalo horn headdress. There were no schools in his early days. His father taught him, and then they moved to Chicago so his father could develop mining equipment, and he finished school there with an eighth grade diploma, and I have to believe that he had a fairly good education between his father and the Chicago schools. Chicago did not amount to a great deal. Nevertheless, we were doomed to stay for a time. I cannot say that I was happy but I had no say in the matter. We soon had all the boys in the neighborhood throwing lassos and playing cowboy. In the spring of 1893, I had my lank form photographed in a new suit with a diploma in one hand and a straw hat in the other along with the rest of my class. The diploma said in beautiful writing that I had been through the eighth grade in Chicago public schools measurement. I never used the diploma. I have seen it a couple of times since, but did not unroll it. It is the only one I ever received, and if I never get any more use out of any I may get in the future than I got out of this one, I will not need them, I'm sure. Then after several years of working in Chicago as a draftsman, he uh, went to Belfouche, South Dakota on stock return tickets on the railroad. One early morning in August, 1896, I woke up in a chair car rolling across the plains of western South Dakota, together with a boy chum who also had the western fever. In marshland, we bought a couple of horses and headed north. This seemed like real life, astride a horse and the Arctic Circle ahead of us. We stopped at all the towns on the northwestern. Many of them afforded good amusement for two boys our age. They were typical western towns. In Old Rich, South Dakota, for instance, the cowboys rode their horses into the saloon and took a drink. Not necessarily to show off, for there were not many to show off to. Often, men were seen with six shooters on their person. They wore them in a very matter-of-course way, as if it were part of their dress, as it was. Gambling was wide open, and every saloon was a gambling house, and there were many of them. The dance halls and the shooting up of the town are all sights I'm glad I have had the opportunity to see and to remember. He spent a winter there and then uh, went to his brother DeWitt's ranch on the on Rosebud Creek near the Yellowstone River. And during his time in Belfouche and uh, in Montana on his brother's ranch, he uh, did a limited amount of art. I spent the winter herding a thousand head of cattle along with some cowboys from the famous old turkey track outfit. We fed in bad weather as this winter was long and cold. A blizzard struck us in March. I've experienced many winter storms in the West, but none have compared with this one. For 36 hours, the snow blew and swirled so fast and furious that one could not see anything distinctly 10 feet away. I've heard many storms since called blizzards but could not in truth call them such. In the early spring of 1903, I sent to Montgomery Ward and Company for some oil colors and other equipment to paint with. And when the snow went off, I made a few crude attempts at picture making. That summer, I covered the mess tent with charcoal studies, horse head and certain characters who worked with the wagon. My brother had taken some of these first attempts to share it in Wyoming, and Mr. W.E. Freeman in a furniture store became interested. Throughout his career, Bill was encouraged by his brother DeWitt, and because of that support, his life as a cowboy was soon to change. In July, we had just worked a herd and shipped and were about to get out and gather another herd, 
when a letter came to me from Mr. Freeman in Sheridan with a check for $50 enclosed and the advice that I had better make some more pictures and send them as he felt he could sell some more. I was bewildered. I hated to quit the wagon and leave my string of horses for someone else to ride. His brother DeWitt took some paintings to a furniture store in Sheridan and they sold readily and he was encouraged by his brother and the editor of the Chicago Art Review to uh, go to the uh, Chicago Art Academy, which he did on two occasions. The Chicago Academy of Fine Arts was the school I attended. I went two months, at the end of which I was informed I had won a scholarship in composition. This announcement bewildered me as I felt it was too good to be true, but it was for it came out in the Chicago papers with a picture of someone else labeled myself. There are several periods uh, in his life when, in the early 1900s when he went back to Chicago and studied at the Academy, which was a, a major art school at that time. And I think it's there that he really worked um, on uh, composition, on how to uh, put the elements of a painting together, on um, color, uh, which uh, he always recorded in his um, writings, was a, a great struggle for him. And also on uh, modeling the figure, and uh, the, particularly the human figure, but also uh, as well the horse, which of course was a very important um, subject in his career. Finances were always short, so school soon let out for me. He considered Wyoming his home. He built a cabin in Sheridan as a studio. Uh, he more or less lived out in a tent uh, until he got married. Then he built another cabin or shack, as he called them, which didn't suffice for his wife. And that's why he ended up in a divorce many years later. Bill had trouble changing his living habits when he married at the age of 39. He bathed as he had on the range. He worked up a sweat, rubbed down with salt, and jumped in a cold stream. He and his bride, Maud Scrivener, separated after a year. She moved to California, but they were not divorced until 10 years later in 1928. Heidi Holtzman with the National Wildlife Art Museum in Jackson spoke with us about Gollings as an artist. Well, he was a very fascinating man and a very, um, as well as an uneven artist, um, as far as his talent went, he was, um, as Bill Ward has said, he was great when he was on, when he was painting well, and he was not so good when he was not painting well. He wanted to be on the range yet wanted to record that way of life and I, I think that was uh, his main issue at, as being an artist is to record what was happening at that time. Bill Galling's popularity in Sheridan in the surrounding ranch area was in part due to his ability to portray their way of life accurately. He, he adapted a little bit of history or washed that into uh, the world that he knew and came out with a visual conclusion that uh, is, uh, is a wonderful reward for us being able to be students of Gollings work today. One of the problems Gollings presents to his audience is the dramatic change in his ability as an artist during his lifetime. However, early Gollings paintings, no matter how rudimentary, are enjoyed for the picture they paint of the vanishing open range. He actually considered himself a better cowman and horseman than an artist throughout his entire career. He never was really satisfied with his artwork until the very end of his career, uh, about 1928. Among Bill's early works is a series of 26 paintings commissioned by Edith Hancock Johnson. Mrs. Johnson, who ranched with her husband in northern Niobrara County, had written the Cowboy's Alphabet. Bill's paintings illustrated her poetry. The project was completed in 1912, but was too costly for publication. Most of Galling's 26 paintings remained in a trunk until 1987. A is for Art of the old Cross A, who has cooked for the cowboys three times a day. 
On Roundup or Ranch, his meals are a treat for hungry cowboys to eat. D is for Donald, the tenderfoot dude who thinks the cowboys are terribly rude until he gets sick on the prairie wide and they dance attendance at his side. J is for Jingler, the lad who's assigned the cavy on the trail to mind. No lightning must disturb them, no thunder make them run. To gather them again would not be fun. V is for Viper, a poisonous snake, which when found in his bed makes the cowboy quake. A quick shot from his gun and the whole thing's o'er. The cowboy crawls in and begins to snore. My inability to get down to work seriously, I have never been able to explain. While I wanted to, and knew that someday I would do so, nevertheless, I was always easily influenced away from my work to visit different ranches, and taking my colors with me, of course, but practically doing nothing. Rebecca Bale, curator for the Gollings Traveling Exhibit, owned by Mr. and Mrs. Arthur E. Nicholas, described Gollings' work habits. Well, what Bill Gollings did is he actually would go out day after day on his horse and just notice everything from a change in the shadows to the light going down and he, he'd even sketch sitting on top of his horse sometimes and he just observed everything and recorded it as he knew it. He had a, a continual struggle he thought with his colors throughout his career which probably wasn't as much of a struggle as he thought it was. This color game is the worst problem a man has to buck in my notion, and when he can get a chance to work with that which please him, he is sure tickled, as I am at present. I have not had this bunch of colors completed till about a month ago, but since I have had it, I don't want anything else. Bill Gollings got advice from, from people like Russell, particularly Russell's uh, protege, uh, Jody Young, helped Gollings overcome some of his uh, some of his technical uh, and uh, aesthetic kinds of problems. Living in Sheridan, I think that um, um, actually uh, was actually, a, a, the town was a pretty important on a small scale um, art center for Wyoming in the early 20th century. Um, the artist Joseph Henry Sharp uh, lived relatively nearby at Crow Agency in Montana. Uh, and Galling certainly knew Sharp uh, very, very early into the century, as, uh, as early as 1906. They had met and uh, traded stories. And uh, Sharp had a considerable artistic training and background in European study and um, would come and, and criticize Galling's uh, paintings and give him advice. Galling's carried on an extensive correspondence regarding his art. One typical letter reads, Dear Joe, thanks for the picture of that horse. He's sure a stem winder for looks. And I guess that old Ranahan that's setting on him is capable of doing the fine work when it comes to teaching him something. Pretty decent weather here, frosty nights and bright warm days. I'm working good. All paint now for a spell. We'll start etching maybe about April 1st. I sure have a lot of oil work to do. I was amused at Bill's reproduction you sent. He has no ideas about Charlie's, and he can't do it. It's wrong to pattern after Russell. There never can be but the one Russell, and he did his work well. He was a strong man. I can't look at his stuff myself without feeling his influence, and I am damn careful to keep from thinking about anything of his I have seen when I am composing a stunt. I say this because it shows Russell's strong work. There's a swing to it that catches a fellow, and it will influence a fellow if you don't look out. Well, Bill has a long way to go, and posing around isn't going to put him any place, not wearing clothes like Russell. He'll get further by going naked. He had a lot of, um, a variety of friends, but he never had anyone very close to him. He was a very generous man, but at the same time he was a very selfish man, so he was very complicated that you find in his letters as well. Gollings frequently used friends, their horses, even their apparel in his paintings. One of the friends easily recognized in Gollings' work is Doc Spear. I believe that he worked quite a while for the Spear Brothers Cattle Company, which was Willis Spear and, and Doc Spear. At one time, they had as many as 58,000 head of cattle, and uh, it seems that they supplied the cattle for the uh, 
Crow and Cheyenne agencies, and they usually called on Bill Gollings to handle the holding of the cattle until they could be dispersed to the Indians. Doc Spear's granddaughter actually happened to come through the museum and was able to take a look at the exhibit and was sharing some stories with uh, me about Bill, um, one of which he had, he was a very poor man, um, never made much from his art, but he, one winter, particularly cold winter, had a buffalo robe coat and, you know, was pr his pride and joy. But he met an Indian that he thought needed it more than he did, so he just took it off his back and gave it to the Indian. And this happened to be, you know, just the way he dealt with people in, in life. By the mid-1920s, Bill Gollings had conquered his problems with color, form, and composition. But the world he had tried to capture on canvas had disappeared. Every time I go out in the hills, I get more and more convinced that there is no more West. It's plumb sickening. There isn't a rider left that has the swing the men used to have. They talk a foreign tongue, and they do things backwards. Well, there is too many gates in the land, and old trails leading to water are called bridle paths. No one seems to know a country by creeks and divides anymore. They know it by haystacks and fence corners, signposts, iron bridges, red barns, and endless other man-made things. If the hay is hauled away when a fellow ain't there to see it, the next time he comes by, he's lost. He uh, really didn't push his art. He uh, barely made enough to live on. He was always broke, really. Always owed people money, but, but paid them back. Made sure he paid them back. Gollings developed a new skill when Hans Kleiber taught him how to make etchings. Gollings' work was soon selling better than Kleiber's in the Sheridan area. Bill's next stunt, as he called it, was the production of pen and ink Christmas cards with his own verse included. The cards were readily purchased by locals and dudes alike. In 1930, Bill personally sent over 900 Christmas cards to his many friends. The many uh, Indian paintings he was able to do uh, were facilitated by his friendship with the Indians on the agencies. He, uh, the Indians liked him. He ran the beef issue for the Indians. He had many Indian friends. That, that's what, he was able to paint the Indians as he saw them, and, and not many other people saw the Indians with that degree of intimacy as Bill Gollings did. Bill Gollings died in 1932 at the age of 54, with a $10 horse and a $20 saddle, a few finished paintings and many which were unfinished. They were all sold off to pay his debts and funeral expenses. Only a few years before, he had written these words. A work for the rest of my life is ahead of me, with only one thing that would ever take me from it, to be younger and have the country open and unsettled, as it was when I first made writing my profession. Today, the works of Bill Gollings can be found in schools, private homes, and museums. Visitors have really enjoyed the exhibit. The one that we've noticed that they really have liked is Indian Sunset, and I think that's primarily because it's, it's such a beautiful painting, and it is from later in his life, so he has really mastered the colors and composition. Um, I think some of the other fun ones have been his self-portrait, um, which shows him as he saw himself as a cowboy cowpuncher. Many Sheridan families acquired a Gollings during Bill's life. There are, there are quite a few pieces of Bill Gollings art in that community, and I'm sure there are many that I don't know about. The school district has a number of uh, excellent Gollings paintings, and they hang in the Fulmer Library in Sheridan. And uh, they acquired those through gifts by the graduating classes. Also, Parent Teachers Association raised money to donate paintings to the school system. The Buffalo Bill Historical Center in Cody has two Gollings, the fight at the Roundup Saloon and the shifting pack. The most extensive Gollings collection, owned by Mr. and Mrs. Arthur Nicholas, is currently on tour, appearing at the C.M. Russell Museum in Great Falls, Montana, the National Wildlife Art Museum in Jackson, the University of Wyoming Art Museum in Laramie, the National Cowboy Hall of Fame in Oklahoma City, 
and the Gene Autry Museum in Los Angeles. Wyoming is, uh, <laughs> Wyoming is a very interesting state. It, it has been a mecca to American painters uh, from the 1830s. This was where you came to, to, to find the image of what the West was. And it went like that for another several generations. And in a sense, kind of it is today. There were two alluring forms of excitement in the atmosphere at this time, the war with Spain and the Klondike Gold Rush. Neither one appealed to me so much as a chance to ride the open range. I realized the cowboy days were about over. The older men in the game told me as much, and I longed to see and be a part of at least the last of it. Like many artists, what we know of Bill Gollings is a lot less than what we don't know. But his work and the journal he kept over the years tell us a great deal about this modest man who rode and painted so well. February 1931, got a ton of coal. Willie came over to buy a sack of it, but I gave it to him. Family having a tough time of it. March 20th, woke up at 2 a.m. with the snow drafting through the shack's cracks on my face. Six below freezing this morning. Finished picture map, feel like I'm out of jail, all through with advertising and other commercial work. August 16th, been painting and have given color a lot of thought lately. Believe I can arrive at some set ideas in regard to it soon. It's always been a hard game for me. Went to picture show to see Gary Cooper in a Mary Roberts Reinhardt story. September 26th, Weasel Bear was here. I gave him shoes, pants, the buffalo coat Doc Spear gave me, some cereal, and one dollar. Beautiful tonight, bright, full moon. Letter from McKay saying I could send his picture anytime it was finished. November 6th, paid a lot of small debts. Bought a sheep-lined corduroy coat and sent my other one to Weasel Bear. December 19th, 1931. Louise, Jane, and Edna left by car today. Helped them pack. Lent them thermos bottle and a blanket. Made some kindling and shavings so they could start a fire if caught in a bad storm. Bill's journal ended there. He died as he had lived, poor in material goods but rich in friends. His legacy to us today is his work, the art of a man who grew immeasurably as he tried to honestly portray the passing of an era. All this country was worth living in. There were antelope in abundance on the prairie and deer in the hills besides wolves and coyotes aplenty. It all seemed a paradise to me. Main Street, Wyoming is made possible in part by grants from Kennecott Energy. Proud to be a part of Wyoming's future in the uranium exploration, mining, and production industry. And by the Wyoming Council for the Humanities, enriching lives of Wyoming people through the study of Wyoming history, values, and ideas.